Welcome to uh, another discipleship training. We are going to continue our series on the framework of discipleship. Um, so what we've been talking about the past two weeks is godly intimacy. Um, and what we had kind of started diving deep into it, we were looking at vulnerability. Um, so from a definition standpoint, right, like intimacy is considered closeness friendship or close familiarity. I, often it's attached to sexual activities. Godly between a, a wife and a husband. Uh, but intimacy encompasses so many other aspects of connection, like vulnerability, trust, honesty, and non-sexual physical actions. Thinking between the, the physical intimacy between siblings, between parents and child, between friends. Um, all of this God desires to have with us, and as was it what it pertains to from a discipleship perspective, is there's only things that God can teach you. There's only revelation that God can bring. There's only things, un greater understanding and knowledge and wisdom that God can bring, and the only way to get that is through intimacy. So close familiarity, close friendship with the Lord. So uh, just we're gonna look at a scripture to do a quick recap. Um, then we'll continue talking about vulnerability and, and what that looks like between God and us. So let's go to uh, John chapter 4, 24 in the English Standard Version. So that's John chapter 4, verse 24 in the English Standard Version. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So what is this is talking about is intimacy with the Lord. But the intimacy we're talking about with God is not the same in which it would be with another person. It has to be in spirit because he is a spirit. <laughs> but it also has to be in truth, in godly truth. He is the word. So his character, his precepts, his commandments, how he says he wants to be intimate with us is how we have to be intimate with him. Part of that and what we've been talking about is vulnerability. So freely revealing our deepest thoughts, insecurities, desires, doubts, fears, like being vulnerable with God. Now let's look at that in scripture. That is in New King James Version. We're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7. So in the New King James Version, we are going to go to 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 7. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. So the things that when it, the scripture is talking about cares, right? It's not just talking about your desires. That's part of it. But that is not what encompasses that whole that, that whole word, it is also talking about your insecurities, your fears, your problems, your anxieties, the issues that you're going through. Everything you care about, cast onto him because he cares for us. So there is that protection in vulnerability. The Lord is saying, you can be vulnerable with me because I actually care about you. <laughs> So there's no risk that if I reveal all to the Lord, he is going to treat me differently. He is going to abuse that classified information or misuse that information. No, vulnerability with the Lord only helps us. And so where we left off and, and where we'll quickly pick up and then move forward is part of being vulnerable with the Lord is revealing ourselves to God. In moving past, like, yes, the Lord knows all things. That is true. The Lord knows exactly what our problems are. That is true. The Lord knows what all of our future problems will be. That is true. He knows everything we've done in the past. That is true. We are still expected to reveal ourselves to him because him knowing is not the same thing as us knowing. Because him knowing is now I need you, which we talked about last week, to give me permission to act on your behalf. But the only way that you can do, know, do that is you have to know. 
You have to tell me. You have to say, Lord, I want you to move this mountain. Lord, I want you to heal this issue. Lord, I want you to take care of this. We have to evoke him, give him permission to act on our behalf, which, quite frankly, is actually the way our law system works. You have to give someone power of attorney. You have to give someone proxy. Trey can't just show up to the bank and say, Donovan told me to come here and withdraw $1,000. They're going to ask, where's your proxy documentation? Where's your power of attorney? Where, show us proof that you have been given permission to act on Donovan's behalf. And because of the way the Lord has established the earth and he's given us dominion over it, it's the same way. We have to evoke him. We have to give him permission, not in the sense of we have authority over him, but we're giving him proxy. Lord, I can't handle this. I need you to move on my behalf. And you have to reveal yourself to God to be able to do that because if you don't, You'll live in denial. You'll live in ignorance. You won't ask the tough questions. You won't deal with the tough issues. So we'll look at a verse that we didn't get to last week, and then we'll move into the new material. So we're going to be in the New King James Version, and we're going to go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. So in the New King James Version, we are going to read uh, in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, and this is Christ speaking, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We, through this scripture, see the culmination of vulnerability and revealing ourselves to God. Because he's saying, I've done my role, which we talked about the past two weeks. I'm knocking at the door. I have told you that I want to have kinship, friendship, relationship, closeness with you. I've already told you that. So we can get over that mental hurdle of does he actually mean that? I've already done that. I've moved past that in, in, in being both vulnerable and vocal of my intentions for you. I've taken the first action. I'm knocking at the door. <laughs> now, here's where we're talking about revealing ourselves. Are you going to open it? Right. I know you're in there. <laughs> like the Jehovah's Witnesses somehow always know when you're home. I know you're in there. <laughs> right? I know you hear me. I know you hear my voice. I know you hear my knocking. And where we got to get out of the mindset is we're sitting in the back of the corner like, Lord, just kick the door down. That's not how this works. <laughs> Right? That's not, if anybody, right now, somebody was knocking on your door and then kicked it down when you didn't answer, you're calling the police. <laughs> this is breaking and entering. I did not give you permission to be here. Yeah. The Lord is going to act in the same way. I am not going to overtake your free will because that's what that would be, right? We have to reveal ourselves to God. We have to open the door and welcome him in. And once we do that, then intimacy can begin. I will come in. Once again, I am vocal and vulnerable about my intentions with you. If you open this door, I'm not going to run away. If you open this door, you're not going to see me abandon you. Welcome me in. I'm coming in. <laughs> and we will dine together, which is another like symbolism of intimacy. We're going to break bread. We're going to fellowship. That is what it means to dine together. We're going to talk, right? We're going to have relationship. We're going to share some jokes, some funny stories. We're going to overcome some stuff together. But you have to reveal yourself to me by opening the door. And we as disciples, when we are discipling others, especially babes in Christ, this is something that has to be taught. Because vulnerability is scary. There is risk to vulnerability, even between the, the disciple and discipleship relationship. How can I trust that I can tell Jermiko my, my innermost secrets? Right? That, that is a risk. But we have to get them to understand that, that that risk does not exist with God because his intentions are pure of heart. He only wants what's best for us. But contrary to what most people think about God, we have a role to play. 
there's actions that we have to do. And it's only 10 to 20% of the equation. He's already came the majority. We can handle that 10 to 20% that is a requirement of us to say like, Lord, I want what you are offering. And that is what revealing ourselves to God means. We, we open the door when we hear him knock and hear his voice. Any thoughts, questions, or comments there before we go into the new material? Um, So part of vulnerability, right, is also living in God. So in freely revealing our deepest thoughts, insecurities, desires, doubts, fears, all of the things that come with vulnerability, you can't be in the position to do that unless you are in relationship with someone, right? It is hard to be vulnerable and being sincere and truthful and trustworthy and all those great adjectives, and I don't know who you are. But you could just be telling me a sob story, for all I know. <laughs> and so, same thing applies to, to God. Well, if you want me to move on your behalf, that you want me to help you with this issue, you want us to have these conversations, well, there needs, this relationship needs to be a two-way street. I can't do everything. I won't do everything. You have to live in me. Right? You have to, because that vulnerability and living in God is going to help you be more vulnerable. Because the Holy Spirit is going to intercede on your behalf. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you those deep, dark thoughts that you don't want to think about anymore. That's in our subconscious, the things that we bury deep within, the trauma, the hurt. The Holy Spirit reveals all. We only have access to that, though, in living in him. So in the New King James Version, we are going to go to John chapter 15. And we're going to read verses 4 through 6. So we're going to be in the New King James Version, John chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Abide in me, and I in you. So stopping here real quickly. Like what we've seen so far through intimacy and vulnerability, right? It is this two-way street. We keep seeing If you let me in, I will dine with you, you will dine with me. Draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. We keep seeing this preface statement before we get to any of the additional context. It's me and you. Abide in me and I in you. It has to happen together. So it's that living in him that we can only truly be vulnerable with the Lord. Because you can't be vulnerable with someone you do not know. It's downright awkward. (laughs) And it's weird. And there's this risk involved, right? You can't be vulnerable with a complete stranger. And we have to stop. We have to stop really removing our common sense when it comes to dealing with other humans and then dealing with God and trying to make it different in the sense of how things play out. You're not going to be vulnerable with a stranger. Well, how do you think you can be vulnerable with God who you haven't prayed, communicated, or studied his word with in two years? It's going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. I haven't spoken to you in two years. All of a sudden now I'm going to be like, Lord, these are my problems. And there is a difference between throwing up a Hail Mary prayer when you are at your worst than being vulnerable. That is not the same thing. That is, Lord, I am desperate. Move on my behalf. Vulnerability goes deeper than just what you want me to do for you in your moment of need. Everybody see that difference? Okay. Um, So abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So the Lord is being very clear that vulnerability is part of relationship with him. And you can't do it. You can't produce fruit. You can't move past your issues. You can't live in victory and prosperity without him. And these are all the things that come from vulnerability. 
Because the Lord can only help you when you invoke him. When you tell him, these are the issues. These are my desires. These are my anxieties. Whatever it is you're being vulnerable about, vulnerable about, then the Lord can move on your behalf because we have relationship. And you can prosper. You can do the hard work that vulnerability comes with, right? Yes, the Lord is saying, tell me about your childhood traumas. I'm going to help you do the work to get through them. I'm not just going to wave my hand and all of a sudden you're going to forgive everyone who ever abused and hurt you. No, I'm going to help you do the work to get there. You'll never get there without me. You'll never get there without vulnerability. Once again, that, that 80, 90, he going to take care of it. It's that 10 to 20. I'm going to help you do the work. Through my spirit in you, I'm going to empower you to do the work. I'm going to give you the victory. I've already claimed it. It's guaranteed if you do the work. So this is where it's talking about living in him. Is with vulnerability comes work. You can't tell the Lord, here are my insecurities. And then he'd be like, thanks for letting me know. We ain't going to do nothing about them. <laughs> here are my doubts. Thanks for letting me know we're not going to deal, about, deal with them. Here are my fears. That's good information to know. We're going to put that on the back burner right now. No, work comes with vulnerability, but you cannot do the work if you're not living in God. Because you're not going to listen to him. Like, we can just start from jump. Somebody hurt you, and there's trauma attached to it. The first thing the Lord is going to say, you got to forgive him. Well, if you're not living in him, that's an unreasonable expectation. Lord, you, you want me to get over what? You want me to move past? How am I supposed to do that? Well, you can't get the answers to those questions unless you live in him. I will say, too, when it comes to relationship with anyone, including God, uh, for people to have patience, because you build a relationship. It's not instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And I think I see that a lot of times with people when I'm talking to them or discipling them, they think that it's an instant relationship with Jesus because they got born again, meaning they got water, they repented, got water baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's just like, no, because... It takes time for you to continuously go back to him and pray, talk to him, reveal stuff to him, open up to him, read his word. And the more you keep doing those activities, the more you will start to, one, as you're reading the word, start to understand it. Two, as you pray to him, eventually you'll start to hear him communicate or sense the communication. But everything is not immediate. And I think a lot of times people give up on that. Because they're like, well, I tried it and nothing happened. Um, and you can't try to build a relationship. You just have to do it. So I just want to say that. And for people to have patience with that, because yeah. that's not an overnight process developing a relationship with God. Yeah. And I mean, and once again, it goes back to that common sense. No one gets married and then it's just like, or precious. You shouldn't get married yeah, and then be like, okay, there's nothing else I need to do. I married you, didn't I? <laughs> right? Same thing with friendship. Tramigo, you're my best friend. Okay, I'm not going to talk to you no more, though. <laughs> but you're my best friend. Right. Right? It's, it's the same thing with Jesus. Salvation does not make a relationship. All it does yeah. is you're now qualified to be in relationship because you've done the necessary steps that there is no break. Yeah. Right? You are in now in right standing and, so, and getting born again. You got to stay there. <laughs> it doesn't cement you. Yeah. You're just now qualified. And it's, that's the way we have to approach our relationship. And this is what the Lord, when I've been studying this aspect of the framework, is it's common sense, common sense, common sense. Like, we make relationship with the Lord seem so mystical. <laughs> like, it's this arbitrary thing that no one can really touch and we can't really nail down. And don't, we don't really understand. And the Lord is just like, treat have a relationship with me the same way you would have with a friend. Someone you call friend, you treat them a certain way. You operate differently. Or at least you should. Yeah. Now, if you mistreat all your friends, like, that's a different conversation. <laughs> but common sense, if I'm saying that we're friends, the person on the other end of that statement is going to expect certain treatment. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the Lord. You can't say, Lord, I love you, and then you misuse, abuse, and you're, now you're trying to figure out like, I just feel like we don't have a relationship. You don't. <laughs> You're not using common sense. Okay, so we're staying in the New King James Version. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2, 
verse 1 through 11. Once again, that is in the New King James Version, Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And this is, and this is, I mean, it's really, there is no point in being, there, true, there is no point in even going down this path if you are not going to live in God. Because being vulnerable with the Lord, but like I said earlier, it takes work. But there's also the implied of I want to move past whatever I'm being vulnerable about. If you don't want to live in him, don't waste his time. Because that's the only way you're going to move past this. Like Shemiko said, it's that patience of relationship of going through the hills, the valleys, the ups and downs, the curves, and getting this thing worked out. It's not that the Holy Spirit is not all-powerful, all-knowing, all-capable. He is. But we as human beings are vulnerable, incapable, have no power outside of the Holy Spirit, are to our core flawed because of our flesh. So you take the spirit, which is all powerful, all knowing, all capable, but you put it in a, you put him in a flawed object. (laughs) There are going to be some hills, there are going to be some valleys. Not because of him, but because of us. We don't listen as intently as we should. We don't obey the first time. We don't trust in every aspect of our relationship. We're not robots. And the Lord knows that, right? It's not like he is oblivious. (laughs) Like, why is this not working? He's willing to put in the work. He's willing. He, scripture says that he is long suffering, which means that is patience enduring through obstacles. We got to get on the same page. We got to be realize Rome wasn't built in a night. I'm not going to be over every issue in a night. I'm not going to have every character flaw fixed in a night. But as long as I continue to be vulnerable, revealing myself, living in him, doing the work, understanding that eventually it's going to get solved. Eventually it's going to get healed. Eventually it's going to get removed. You just got to stay the course. And so many people get wrapped up in the miracle power of the Holy Spirit, which exists, which we've seen, which happens. But if it was normal, it would not be considered a miracle. (laughs) If it was an everyday occurrence, it would not be considered a miracle. So just because you heard someone had a miracle experience in which whatever they were going through was gone in a day, was over in a night, didn't take forever, that doesn't mean that's going to be your testimony. Doesn't mean it won't. But we have to move past the mindset of, I tell God my issue, the Holy Spirit moves on my behalf, and by the end of the week, it's resolved. <laughs> That's just not how relationships work. And especially the Holy Spirit, in empowering us, he can only move as fast as we allow him to. Yeah. A person who experienced the miracle, maybe in that moment, every door was down, every wall was gone, and they truly, fully bought in and was 100% lined aligned mentally, verbally, physically, and the Lord was able to move it instantaneously because everything aligned up to unlock it. That's not going to be everybody. That's not going to be every situation because they could have had a miracle in one situation, but the rest of their life, that didn't happen. And miracles (laughs) are not the rule, they're the exception. So if you're trying to live by the exception and not the rule, you're going to have a very miserable life. That's what makes a miracle a miracle. It's not a common occurrence. And truthfully, we as a, we as a body need to get off the miracle high. Because that's all we testify about. No one gets up and testifies, you know, the Lord healed me from childhood trauma and I was able to forgive my parents, but it took 20 years. Don't nobody want to hear that testimony. <laughs> Don't nobody want to hear that. I was addicted to alcohol for 50 years and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I was delivered and working through him and dealing with the root causes of my addiction. 
That is not a testimony people want to hear. They want to hear popcorn, microwave, instant ramen. You prayed, he answered, it changed. We got to get off that high. Yeah. And so many churches, that's how we truly, that's all you really hear now. Every sermon, every testimony, every song, it's popcorn action. And you're taking what Tremiko just said, exceptions. And you're, ma- and you're normalizing it to make people who are inexperienced in the Lord think it's the rule. So I'll, uh, I'm rereading a book I read before um, where this guy totally became a scammer um, in the Hold church. On, he became a scammer oh. in the church where he started off right serving the Lord and then he ended up. He ended up going to the occult side, but everybody still thought he was on God's side. But he was explaining that what they understand in the occult world is that people want that instantaneous stuff. They want money. They want miracles. They want this, this, and that. So what they do is when they run their crusades, this is over in Africa, and services and stuff like that, they focus basically on... That's the message. And when they put their flyers together, this is what's going to happen. People show up. And there's a lot more behind the story that I'm not sharing because that's not the topic. But because what I'm saying is that that's the era we're in. And a lot of churches, even in America, see, oh, this is what the people want. Let's yeah. give people what they want. Let's not give them the truth or what they need. And so if you as a normal, I'm going to say bystander, start going to church and you don't recognize which you won't recognize unless someone fill you in you think that this is normal that everything's a miracle everything's a miracle everything's a miracle because those in leadership are feeding everybody candy instead of giving them the vegetables so and it does a huge again as we've been talking about disservice because you get this generation of people who don't learn how to develop a relationship with god and and if we're quite honest the day-to-day life that we have with God and relationship that we have with God is not spectacular. There's not unicorns flying across the sky. There isn't a rainbow in the sky every single day and the stars are twinkling bright and singing. That's not the everyday walk with God. The everyday walk with God is, oh, it was cloudy today. Oh, we had some sun today. Oh, we keep getting these thunderstorms, scattered thunderstorms throughout the day every week. Okay, this was a good week. Okay, this was a bad week. I mean, that's the relationship. It's like a normal relationship. It's just that you're able to tap into this higher power, which is God, whose name is Jesus, and receive power, assistance, help, guidance that normal people don't get because they don't have that relationship. And so people don't understand this. And so when you give them the truth and the right path, they're like, oh, I'm done with you. Let me go down the street to X, Y, Z. Because they into the miracles and the fast. Yeah. And so it seems like when you do it the right way, it's just like, well, dang, ain't nobody listening. Don't nobody. Blah, blah, blah. And the Lord just keeps saying, no, no, no. Keep doing it the right way. Because we will come across, what do we call it, persons of peace. That they're like, yeah, I, I, I had all the candy and the bubble gum. I'm done with that. My I teeth are rot. Yeah, I need the <laughs> real stuff. So just, just as an encouragement for those who are disciples that are like you're doing the right thing but it feels like people aren't listening and then um for those who didn't know the truth of the matter this is the truth of the matter and this is the thing and this is where i mean i I think this is why a lot of people in america struggle with marriage as well is a successful marriage is routine and what i mean i'm not saying boring you don't care about each other's interests that's not what i'm talking about routine it's day to day, you know what to expect. Uh, your video feed is gone. Interesting. Okay. Uh, just a second. Hold on, let me just check on my phone. Uh, oh, I see it. Oh, you see it? Right here. Yeah. Right here. And I see it right here. Charlene. I double think it might check. be, yeah, double check your connection. It could be you, because I see it on the screen. Uh, Adriana, can, uh, Adriana, you, Adriana. can you see our video? Yeah, I can't tell. Just Me and Donovan? Oh. She's probably trying to get unmuted. Okay. Yes. Okay. I can. Cool. cool. Yeah, so, Charlie, you might need to sign in and sign back out. Sign out and sign back in. Good night. 
Or, you know, if you don't, you don't care about the video. Uh, okay. <laughs> for, uh, All right, for well, thanks for saying something. That was a good chat. Um, yeah, so a successful marriage is routine. Don't get too high, don't get too low. You have, you know, communication. We get through the day-to-day. Sometimes it's going to be a great day. Sometimes, eh, it wasn't. It was a regular week. It's not these highs of drama and, and, and unleashed passion and we fighting and at each other's throats and then we're loving passionate. No, that's not a successful marriage. That's a toxic one. <laughs> that's a who? Toxic oh, relationship toxic. where it's these extremely high highs but these ridiculous crash lows where you're literally moving from one extreme to the next. You got a toxic relationship. You just do. And it's the same thing with the Lord. It's not that they're not going to be days of summer and spring. It's, I think you said it last week or the week before. Seasons. It's, it's that, that seasonality. But you know what to expect. Lord, this is a rough week, but I know in the end, however long this storm lasts, in the end, as long as I keep the path, keep doing what I'm supposed to do, keep meditating, keep living, keep walking, eventually, we're going to get from under this pile. That routine. Not getting too high, not too low. Let me stay consistent. That's the case for anything. That's the case for excellence. That's the case for success. That's the case for learning a new skill. That's the the case for a relationship. It's can you get into the routine, the consistent day-to-day, this is what I'm doing, this is what it takes, this is what I'm doing, this is what it takes. Everybody who's jumping from extreme to extreme, they're not going to be very successful. And what I get to is when people are doing the day-to-day, how how'd you just phrase it? The routine. Ru- the routine. Um, I get a, a lot of questions, which I'm glad I get the questions. They're like, am I doing something wrong? Should I be doing something different? Yeah. Do I need to change it up? And it's like, no, no, no. Nope. No, stay the course. Like, this, this is the life. Yep. It's not... And I think that is, you're right, people are like, we should be high here and then low here and then boom here. And it's just like, no, it's, it's a steady stream. And it's too steady for people. Sometimes they're like, this can't be it. Don't I suppose, like, I need to switch it up, right? Yep. It's like, no, <laughs> keep the course. So, yeah, I think we just need to keep repeating that message to people. And, and I get it, like, because when I was starting to develop my relationship with God, like, and, and I love the questions is because I had those exact same questions, like, Am I doing it right? Do I need to switch it up? Should I be doing it? Because you don't know what you don't know because it's not like we live in a world of discipleship. Yep. So everybody out here just trying to figure it out themselves. And then when you get to a place where you figure it out, maybe you have compassion and you say, well, I don't want anybody to go through what I went through. So let me reach back and try to help other people, which is what I'm totally trying to do. Because I'm like, I wish somebody would have discipled me. I wish I could have gotten a lot of my questions answered. But... That is what it is. And so, yeah, I, I totally get why it's hard for people to develop this relationship with God because there's not a lot of teaching on it and a lot of discipling on this is what this looks like. Yeah. And I think it also comes with, and this is where we're talking about in mentorship, this aspect of experience, lived experience, and, and age and the, the wisdom that does come with age. That whole lightning in a bottle, day-to-day passion and loss, that's a young person problem. You talk to somebody who's 50, I ain't trying to deal with that. <laughs> that's, that's frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I want to know what to expect yep. every single day. Yep. You telling me this up and down roller coaster, and I see that in a relationship. A lot of young people who get married, just like, when we started dating, there was just this, this passion that we have for life and for each other. And it's like, yeah, that passion and life and, and wanting the, all the hills and the valleys and the bottom outs, that's cool when you're 20. That's not cool when you're 35. <laughs> and you got responsibilities. And you got children to take care of. Because they also are part of that relationship. And so with the Lord, it's the same thing. The Lord is just like, stay the course. Stay the course. Th- there are going to be some highs, 100%. But that is... The exception, not the rule. Stay the course. Mastery of skill is routine. Stay the course. You got to do it over and over and over. And when it's time to move in something new, then you're going to feel it. Then you're going to miss them routine days. When you're back into the, I don't know how to do this. (laughs) And I'm trying to learn and trying to figure it out. And it's difficult and it's uncomfortable. And then you'll get into a routine. 
I would say it like this. There's like milestone moments you yeah, have in your good. walk with God. Like in your regular life, you don't have a 25th birthday all the time. Nope. Or what, 40 and then 50 and then 60 or whatever like that. Those are like once in a while, every few years, you know what I'm saying? And more than a few years, space out milestone moments. And it's like that in our relationship with God. You're not going to have these very exciting, dramatic experiences every single day. And that, I will say, is one problem I do have with certain ministries that go online and like, it was awesome, and it was this, and blah, 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 and try to, and I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to hype up, hey, this relationship with God is great, and you should have it. But then when people get in, they like, this is shoot. boring. Yes, like, <laughs> this is not what you said it was. And to even be, and I know what I'm saying is legit because I was legit in person with these people and went out and ministered with these people. And brother man, by the time we came back to the group and they started giving testimony, it was so hyped up. And I was like, well, wait a minute now, because I was there and it was not that exciting. It was not that. I'm just like, okay, so so it gave me a look behind the scenes like, oh, they really hyping this relationship up. When it, and these experiences up and yeah they're really good works that are being done and stuff like that but when you over hype yeah. but then when you under explain it leaves people at a disadvantage because it's two different extremes it's like can we get to a balanced place to explain a relationship with God and again yeah. there aren't these um miraculous um milestones that are happening every single day it's really spaced out and one thing i was going to say the image that god gave is like an abraham or a jacob yeah they had some very interesting milestone i will say moments and encounters with god but if you check their life abraham lived like a hundred and something years right how many of them days in his life which is like oh my god this is totally awesome this is totally rad this is no, it was not like a lot of it was stay the course. Exactly, stay a the lot course. of that was just stay in the course. Boom, you had this milestone experience. Wow, that was amazing. Okay, let me keep living my life another twenty five years. Boom, you have another one. Okay, let me live my life maybe another forty years later. So that's the realistic picture. Yeah, it is. Um, so there's this, and this is the thing. Like once again, when I. Now that I have children, right, with years, with lived experience comes wisdom. And when I was a younger man, I mean, I'm not an old man, but I was younger than what I am now, there was like this popular thing that this one pastor used to say of like, you know, uh, the Lord paid my bills this month or, you know, like routine things. Like I had food in my fridge, rent, and things were taken care of is not a testimony in this house. Because he was, from his perspective, he was saying it's an expectation. Now, when I was younger, and even now, I still agree with him to a certain extent. When I was younger, I was all in. Like, yeah, that's, that's basic. That's routine. And he was trying to come from the perspective of you should expect this if you have a relationship with him. But once again, overhyped, underexplained. Yeah. And now that I'm older, right, and wiser, and have seen that a person getting rent paid for some people ain't routine. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a monthly experience and seeing that things that I consider mundane and routine are a blessing in and of themselves yeah. and so that's where we have to get to where it's there is a blessing in the mundane in the routine yeah. me having me and my family having a roof over our head every single day is a blessing because there are some people where that would be considered a miracle and we have to really change our focus where the routine and the mundane are talked down upon because they're not sexy enough because they don't fill seats. Yeah. And then when you get people in the door, they're expecting that they're going to go up to Mount Sinai and hear the voice of the Lord every single day. Yeah, he got to perform tricks every day. <laughs> and, he's, no, and no one wants to be in that type of relationship. Repeat that. That God has to perform tricks every day to keep you. He's like, you can just walk away then. Because I'm not about to prove. What do you tell people? I'm not giving you a sign. You want a sign every single day? Exactly. No. We need to get to a point where we can be routine here. And who wants to be in that type of rela performative relationship? Yeah, I got Where for me to keep you as my wife, 
every single day I got to go above and beyond. Because eventually, you're going to hit a clap, like a, yeah. a plateau. Because you can only do <laughs> the fiery bush a couple times before people be like, you ain't got nothing to Exactly. <laughs> All right, that was cool. Uh, exactly. You can only walk on water a few times before people be like, Okay, that's all right. What's yeah, next? Normal, yeah. You can only feed five thousand with five loads. And two, you get what I'm saying? Like eventually, yeah, you have to keep coming up with new tricks every single day because you're gonna have to you have to re up. Yeah, that's not a healthy relationship. It's performative. That's not vulnerability. It's performative, and we have to instruct and build up disciples correctly. That there is the work, the blessing, the growth is in the mundane. It is in the routine. You'll have these miraculous milestones, but those are the exception. Those are not the rules. Not the rule. And we get that from living in him and understanding who he is. Because trust me, the Lord, from his perspective, the Lord, and what I've said since we've been talking about this and when we talked about knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, mastery is in the routine. You cannot get to mastery Jumping from one extreme to the next. It's not. Imagine if you had a contractor building your house and they were jumping from one extreme to the next. Yeah. I'm going to put this as no. Maybe we can talk about that as a gather talks milestone moments and whatever. I don't know. Adriana. Yeah, that would be good. Oh, Charlene says the video is showing again. Okay, okay great. Okay, cool. And then uh, Adriana. Oh. oh, go ahead. No, yeah. Sorry, that was Cohen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have to get into that perspective, right? That in being vulnerable and living with the Lord is understanding. The goal is not to have a high every single day. It is to get to mastery. And for you to do, it's routine. You have a contractor come build your house. One day, they knock in 12 hours and you see in progress, but then you don't see them for two weeks. Because they didn't hit this low, right? It didn't drop off. Oh, that's just how it works. I have these peaks and I have these valleys. Well, you told me it would take 45 days. <laughs> if, if we start building out this pattern, this house ain't going to get built in 45 days. And it's the same thing. It's routine. How do I get into this routine? You living, living with the Lord, living in him, walking with him, because what he's going to do is he's going to start showing you step by step. And sometimes those steps... Take a couple years to master. Just sit here and learn and observe and practice and perfect. And then, then I will tell you what the next step is. Right. We can't keep, like, Lord, I've been doing this for two years. Well, you've been doing it for two years because you ain't mastered yet. The goal is mastery. Consist- you're not consistent enough in it yet, so we can't move past it. And this is what we miss is the Lord doesn't do anything just for doing something. It's connected. Where I'm trying to take you, you're going, this is a base level skill. If you don't have this, you can't get here. If you don't know how to do addition, you keep asking me to go to multiplication. You don't know how to add. (laughs) If you can't do this, you won't be able to multiply. And I'm trying to get you to calculus. But we get so obsessed with, well, I want to get to calculus. There, there's a process. There's a life. There's a journey that has to take place there. And you have to be open and vulnerable to get that from the Lord. I will say this, because this, this just dropped in my head. I believe that a number of people also feel like, well, there's, aside from God, they think he can just do everything and he's in control. They also feel like there is no, there's not much that they need to do because the anointing to just come in and take care of that, that gap right there. Yeah. And it's just like, there is no getting away from, we have to be patient, we have to apply effort, and we have to see that this is a walk, right? It's not a sprint. And so there is no power of God that's just going to come in and just fill all the gaps because you feel like there are certain things you shouldn't have to do or um, it takes too much time. So Lord, just come in and do it. Um, And I think some people tend to misunderstand the anointing from that perspective too. Like, 
oh, you know, I don't have to build a skill set. Because yeah. it's really a skill set, having a relationship with God. is learning how to, number one, be close and intimate with someone that you cannot see. That's, that's, that's a skill set, I would say, because everybody don't have that. Um, being able to hear from God. Of course, we know you have to have a spirit that will help all these components, but there is a level of skill set because I have to keep doing this. Like you say, we're not going to move to multiplication because you don't have addition. Well, that's me developing a skill set to be able to add. So now we can add the next layer so that when we get to that next layer, I can know what I'm doing and develop a better skill set adding this next layer here. So we got to see it as a relationship with God is also building a skill set and, and endurance, I would say, to be able to to manage and navigate when the rough roads come. So Yeah, there is when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, and, and specifically when we're talking about vulnerability, I, you're absolutely right. There is this fear of hard work in Christianity. And I fundamentally believe is why you have this false doctrine of no works. It's so popular because it addresses that fear. You ain't got to do nothing. (laughs) And that's just not how the Lord works. Like even in the sense, because everyone has skills, gifts, proficiencies that come naturally. Right. That comes from the Lord. But in our mind, like, oh, you're really skillful at that. Versus some other things. You know, I got to work on that. Even in the things that you're proficient at, you still got to do a little something, something. Like, it's not just, like, I just woke up like this. Like, that is very rare. And in the event that you meet people that have that type of skill set and that proficiency, it's an exception. It is not the rule. (laughs) Right? That's not normal. That's not every day. Like, when I was in college, I I went to college. Like, a classmate of mine was... 12 years old. You know how many other 12 year olds I met walking my campus? No. None. <laughs> he was one of 10,000 students, undergrad. Not the norm. Right? And we have to, with the Lord, we got to understand it is a journey. And this is why this talking about godly intimacy and in, in, in discipleship is exactly to Tremiko's point. It is a skill set. That has to be developed. But if no one tells me this, if no one tells me that developing with a relationship with the Lord takes time, that getting knowledge, understanding, and wisdom and revelation from the Lord takes time, and and, and manifesting the spiritual promises of the Lord takes time. If no one tells me that, I'm going to walk into this relationship thinking, like, what's going on? There's either something wrong with me or there's something wrong with him. It got to be him because what everyone else told me, what everyone else is experiencing, and I'm doing everything they say to do, but I'm not getting it. The source is the problem. That's the, that's the incorrect perception. And so then people walk away. Yeah. Because I was sold a false bill of goods. And the Lord is like, I didn't make you those promises. Yeah. Nowhere in my word does it say everything that... All the good that is going to happen to you in our relationship is, not, is going to come without any bad and it's going to happen immediately, instantaneously. The moment you go down in water, full submersion, in Jesus' name, repent and be filled with the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues. You get everything. <laughs> That's just not how it works. So, in the New King James Version, in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, and we're going to walk through that, that, that process, right? So, like, listen from the words of the scribe who is speaking from the perspective of God. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you. So Paul's in that verse one. He already saying there's something for you to do. You have to receive and you have to treasure. When you treasure something, you're taking care of it. You're making sure it's still there, right? You're locking it up. You're treating it with the value that it deserves to be treated. So right, verse 1 is already telling us there is an expectation of effort that you have to put in. If you do that, so that you incline your ear to wisdom, you start building these skill sets and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver 
and search for her as for hidden treasure. So talking about the value of understanding, of wisdom, of knowledge. So we get four verses of what we got to do. <laughs> yeah. If this, if this, if this, if this, finally in verse five, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you. So before we get to any of the promises, all we see is effort yep. and work. And get this. This is what I love about this passage of the scripture. The promises, the riches, the blessings are relationship. This passage doesn't talk about then you will get all the money in the world. Then you will get the big house. Then you will get what the describer says is you will receive relationships. <laughs> that's what you'll get you'll get the ability to know the mind of the Lord to understand, to comprehend his thoughts and build skills that you can then apply that is the benefit and from that benefit then you get access to blessings and treasure and protection and his shield and him moving on your behalf and providing for you but the, the, the true blessing is the relationship. But to get to the relationship, we have to be vulnerable. We have to live in him. We have to treasure his word. We have to lean our ear. Leaning takes effort. It takes balance. It takes physical strength. I literally have to force myself to lean. That is what this is talking about. You are doing the work to, I know I want to, my flesh is telling me to listen here. I'm going to lean to the spirit. Like all of that takes effort. And living in him, that is that vulnerability. Because now the Lord, which we'll, we'll I don't know if we'll get to today, but when we start talking about trust, we look at trust with the Lord as a one-way street. It's not. It's a two-way street. The same way in which we have to open ourselves and be vulnerable to the Lord, he's already proven himself. The only person in this relationship who hasn't is us. So from the Lord's perspective, you want, you want my deep truths? You want to know me? You want to know my mind? You don't have to prove yourself. I got to see some consistency. You got to open yourself up to me. You got to reveal yourself. You got to live in me. Only then when I see that routine, then will I give you knowledge, give you understanding, give you wisdom. And this is in a sense of that he doesn't want to freely give. He does freely give. It's not you earning it. It's you proving you are trustworthy of it. The same way anyone in your relationship or friendship, you got to prove trustworthy of my vulnerability. That if I tell you something, you will handle it with care. That you would treat it as the treasure and the value that it is. Same mindset of the Lord. Not that I don't want to give. It. Matter of fact, I want to give freely. But you got to prove that you are trustworthy. Because the difference between our vulnerabilities... In our secrets, in our deep things, from the Lord, is his deep thoughts move mountains. His vulnerabilities are power. Trusted with the wrong person does harm. And Tremiko kind of alluded to it when she was talking about the book she just read of old boy who started right but now working for Satan. So everything he learned, he's now abusing. So the Lord is like, I'm not about to just give this to anyone and everyone. <laughs> Because if I give you something deep and you misuse it and abuse it, people aren't going to ascribe it to you misusing and abusing. They're going to blame me. So we have to prove ourselves trustworthy. And that's what this passage of scripture is talking about. Before we get relationship, we got to prove ourselves trustworthy through our pursuit of the Lord. Any thoughts, comments, questions there before we go to the next verse? Yeah, it's just, we got to... I don't know. I just it's I don't know. It's 
it's difficult and well it's probably been difficult since the church started but to show people that um, go ahead Trina Oh. No, she raised her hand. Trina, go ahead. You can speak. Oh, yes. I just want to say I do agree with you, Donovan. I think more often we don't consider that when we mistreat his word and mistreat God's people, it's not attributed to God, but, you know, it's the people, and they don't think about that. And if we thought about that more often, I believe that we would have less of that happening in the body of Christ. Yeah. And, this, and think about it. Like, we... And this is where, like, being in the position that I am in now, I see so much more. I should say I understand so much more of the hurt that the Lord goes through every second. Is think about everyone, like, just take a, take a second. You don't have to share it. But think about a person who you trusted with your vulnerabilities, who misused, abused, did you wrong, went and told other people, used them for their own self gain. And the Lord deals with that every second. And this is and this is this is the kicker right here. The Lord already knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> it's not like a shot. <laughs> he knows. This person I already know because he, he knows everything. And he still is making the concerted effort I'm going to put myself out there. I know this person is going to misuse me. But because I love them, I'm still going to give them the opportunity to do right. And even once they did me wrong, forgiveness is still available to them. <laughs> A person cut us off in traffic. We like, I curse you and your whole family. <laughs> we could never, we can't even truly fathom the level of disappointment that the Lord goes through by second not by year not by month not by week not by day but by second in the rejection in the misuse in the abuse of his relationship and his vulnerability we're we're afraid to reveal ourselves to God who is only proving himself to be pure of heart <laughs> Think about it from his perspective. I know you're going to do me wrong. <laughs> and I'm still here. Like, I know it. I expect it. And because I've expe I expect it, I have built a way for you to move past it. For, for when it does happen, for it to be a process to, for us to reconcile. This is how we have to look at it from vulnerability. Like, it's, I'm sorry. Like, I, vulnerability is hard when you're talking about a human-to-human -human experience. Because there is risk involved. Yeah. The, the, the difficulty with vulnerability with the Lord has nothing to do with the Lord. It is on us. Because like I said, there is no one who lives, who will ever live, who has lived outside of Jesus, who has proven himself over a millennia to be as pure in heart, pure of intention, consistent on a day-to-day -day basis. Nobody. And with all our dirt, everything that we did, everything that we will do, every thought that we have, even the ones we didn't entertain, but it still popped up in our head. And the Lord is still like, I don't care about none of that. I still want a relationship with you. Oh, living in him seems to me like a pretty good deal. <laughs> when you think about who, who's getting the short end of the stick <laughs> in that dynamic, it's certainly not us. <laughs> With all our flaws and insecurities and incapabilities, it is the Lord who is getting the short end of that stick. And, and truly giving all the benefit. And the hope that there will be a return on his investment, that we will be developed into effective discipleships to build, we will be <laughs> built into effective disciples to build his kingdom and further his agenda. All right, we're staying in the New King James Version. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So in the New King James Version, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. So we're still talking about vulnerability, living in God. 
so that we can do the work, so that we can build the skill set that it takes to be in relationship with him. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So, what are we trying to understand here? Receiving Christ Jesus comes through the gospel. Right. That's how you receive Christ. It's through the gospel. Understanding that Christ is God the Father manifest in the flesh who came down here with the sole purpose of living as an example, being crucified on the cross, being buried for three days and nights and rising on the third day. Well, yeah, rising on the third day so that we could have access to repentance and remission of sins through his name, which is Jesus. That's how we receive Christ Jesus. So through that, receiving of the gospel, understanding that we have to be born again of water in Jesus' name, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, repenting, and follow his example that he lived through the gospel. That's, that's the so walk in him part. So as we receive the gospel, as we got understanding and knowledge of what the Lord did, how he lived a, a living example for us to follow after, where we don't have the excuse, well, yeah, I'm not God. He had the same flesh when he was down here. He fought the same temptations that we did. And through his power, his spirit, which we now have, he overcame. So walk in him. That is living in Christ. You cannot say, I live in Christ, but when I line up the examples of the walk, them steps not lining up. That is the vulnerability part. Being honest with yourself and vulnerable and being like, Lord, my steps ain't lining up with yours. I'm glad you acknowledged that. Now, let's do the work to fix it. So those steps do get in line. Because that is the goal. That is what he wants. Is for us to reflect his character. To look like him. The only way that happens is our steps get in line. I sound like he sounded. I walk like he walked. I move like he moved when he was on the earth. His character reflects in my character. That people see a light on the top of the hill. That I am still salty <laughs> and good to use for seasoning. That only comes through the vulnerability of living in him. Because you can't say, Lord, my steps don't line up to yours. I don't move how you move. I don't sound like how you sound. My character doesn't reflect your character. And then just be like, I just want to share that information. <laughs> Because the expectation from the Lord is we're going we're gonna to renew your mind. We're going to meditate daily to change those habits, those behaviors. So if you're going to be vulnerable about them, and that's what I said earlier, ain't no point in being vulnerable if you're not trying to do no work. There really isn't a point. It's like being in a relationship with someone, and they say, like, I don't like the way you do X to me. And you're vulnerable and say, you know what? The reason why I do X is because it's tied to, you know, whatever. Okay, I, I'm glad now we're getting somewhere. There's a root cause. Yeah, but I'm not going to fix it. <laughs> but I understand exactly why I do what I do. I'm not going to fix it. I'm not going to change it. You're just going to have to deal with it. Nobody wants to be in that relationship. And the Lord, for sure, is like, I don't. That actually is contrary to the thought. I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> but if you want to spend eternity with me, you're going to have to deal with it. But here's the great thing. I've given you my spirit so you have the power and the ability to do so. All right. Now let's go to the Amplified Classic Edition. So the AMPC, Amplified Classic. And we're going to read Ephesians chapter 3, 16 through 19. And it's interesting, I mean, um, quickly, like, when we look at Colossians 2 and 6, and people quote that, like, so walking him, and it's just like, that wasn't an off statement. 
Like, like Paul in that letter was saying, you received Christ based on your understanding of who he is. And that includes his behaviors, his character, his personality traits. You got to mimic that. <laughs> like, that's the, like, that is the expectation. Like, what was the point of repentance? What was the point of baptism? What was the point of him filling with you with his spirit? And then you walking contrary to what drove you to take those actions. Yeah. And it's the same, and it's, it's truly, we do a disservice to babes in Christ, young disciples, where we don't teach them this, where we don't get down into breaking down relationship, what that looks like with God, what that means, what, what that leads to, what the expectations of it are. We just want to get them in the water and get them filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it's, okay. They've received their past to enter the race. But they've never been taught to run. And that is an ineffective competitor. Like who would show, who would want an Olympian to show up to the Olympics? You got the pass. But it's like, they never coached me. They never taught me how to run. They never taught me how to balance my endurance so I could not get burnt out after the first mile of the race. That's what happens with so many souls. After the first mile, they are completely burnt out because no one's taught them routine. No one's taught them relationship. No one's taught them meditation, godly meditation. No one's taught them how to live by the Spirit. They just got all the candy. And I think it's easier, of course, we have adults and teens and stuff, so you got to work with them where they are. But having a relationship with God would be so much easier if you train them as a child. Yes. Because it's easier for children to tap into the spirit world, to connect with God, also with demons. But um, we're going to go on the positive side with God. So if you train them early how to do that as children... It doesn't become difficult when they reach teenhood and adulthood to have this relationship with God because they've been having it since a child and it was easier for them to just have it as a child because, again, they have that childlike faith. They're not asking, well, why I got to do this and when I got to do this. They can just tap into God and talk to him and, you know, whatever they're going to converse about and have this relationship and tell them about their day and they're excited to do like all of this stuff as a kid because they think it's super cool and if they start that early and matriculate late on up it's easy for them it's not like am I talking to the wind does anyone hear me like they know he does because they've been talking to him since they were probably like five or six so uh, I would encourage you know you have kids or around kids try to train them early to have these relationships and we won't be in this place of trying to get people to learn how to have a relationship. Yeah. Of course, that's always going to be needed because there always will be adults who got to adulthood and didn't learn this at home. But it just would make things easier if we start things with, as kids. And, and Satan knows that, right? Because yep. he's attacking the kids heavily now because he's like, well, if I can just get them as kids, I can shape them how I want them. And, you know, nix all this other stuff. Yeah. And in, in the other aspect of that is they aren't jaded by the realities of the world, ideally. Right? Like, a child is innocent. They, they, they don't know what a bill is. They don't know what, you know, real disappointment is in a normal situation. Right? They, they wake up. Everything is almost provided for them. They, their, their day-to-day is innocent. So, teaching them how to build a relationship, how to trust the Lord with those, what we would consider small problems. But when they do reach adulthood, and they do, the innocence of childhood is now removed, but they've already built that muscle. They already built that muscle memory, those habits. So then applying it isn't difficult because it's like, well, I did this when I was a child. He cared about, you know, me getting to C in math class. Why wouldn't he care about me losing my job? <laughs> and that's how I was taught. And I think it's, it's funny because, and it goes right to your point, like, and we've kind of talked about it last week as well, is it is so much harder to build the skill set of relationship with the Lord, with adults, because we have been jaded by real life. Because we've lost that innocent 
of childhood, like we talked about, like when we were younger, all we talked about was being grown so I can do what I want. I can buy whatever I want. I don't have to listen to mommy and daddy telling me that that's not good for me or that's not a good use of money. I just do whatever I want to do. Not realizing when you become an adult, even if you do have discretionary income, what you want comes second to everything that is mandatory you pay yeah. with that income. Yeah. <laughs> right? This jadedness that comes like, man, adult sucks. <laughs> like, why did I ask her this? Like, I look at my children now. Every day is just pure joy and wonderment for them. Just running around, excited to learn. They have no idea <laughs> that that is not going to be forever. And now I understand it so much so as to why my parents were so hard on me staying in a child's place. Mm-hmm. And it, it was not to be disrespectful in the sense that you don't have a mind of your own or you shouldn't have opinions or things like that. They really were trying to protect my innocence. Like, you are asking for something that is not what you think it is. It's pros and cons with everything. Exactly. Stay in a child's place. And so as adults, when we're trying to build that relationship, and this is why, like, we're spending so much time on this framework, is because oftentimes that's who we are discipling. Now, it's really adults. It's people who have been jaded by life, who are cynical, who have had the rug pulled from under them, who've had disappointment, broken promises. You still got to build that skill set. And that is why so many get burnt out in that first mile with the Lord is because they were given a marketing sales pitch. Mm-hmm. But when they, got, when they got in the car, they realized it was a limit. <laughs> it don't operate like that. They were sold the mountaintop but didn't realize when they was looking at the picture, it was a closed-in picture. <laughs> that real life, you are quite a ways <laughs> from that mountaintop. And even when, even if you're at the base of the mountain, like Moses experienced, you still got to go up. <laughs> so we really have to get people to hone in on this and understand, like, it, it, I just, it just really, what Tremiko said resonated with me, that building a relationship with the Lord is a skill set. It is, and how it operates, how you got to move in differently in it, because it's not the same thing as me calling up Trey and be like, yo, let's get together today. Right. Oftentimes, human beings, we operate under the premise, out of sight, out of mind. The Lord is literally out of sight. (laughs) So how do I develop this long-distance relationship? Where how he communicates is not the same as how I talk to my friends on a daily basis. How his spirit moves in me, even conviction, and when he's trying to direct me, how do I know that this is, not, this is him and not bubble guts? Or how do I know this feeling in my chest is conviction and not just heartburn? Like, that, that takes skill <laughs> to be able to distinguish the two. And that's why people <laughs> want to lean on things like crosses. Or yep. Cause it's not like we got a photo of him or we got nothing. It's like, you want me to take thin air Yep. And then just develop this relate, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it." And so, it's a skill set for sure. So, in the Amplified Classic, so Ephesians chapter three, verses sixteen through nineteen, may He grant you out of the rich treasure of His glory to be strengthened and reinforced with mighty power in the inner man by the Holy Spirit. Himself, being God, indwelling your innermost being and personality. May Christ, through your faith, actually dwell, settle down, abide, make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love. What is the breadth and length and height and depth of it? Here's what he's talking about. That you may really come to know practically through experience for yourselves the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience that you may be filled 
through all your being until all the fullness of God may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. Go back up to 18 real quick. So just so we make this connection here. That you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love, that love of Christ that he's talking about. What is the breadth, length, height, and depth of it? The breadth, length, height, and depth is knowing the fullness of God on the inside. Nowhere is he talking about the things. As we saw in Proverbs, it's not about the things. It's not about the tangible items. It's about the intangible, the relationship. And from there, the joy, the peace, the understanding, the knowledge, the wisdom that comes from that inner relationship. It is not about what we get. (laughs) And that is what this whole aspect of vulnerability is. Being vulnerable is revealing our deepest thoughts, insecurities, desires, ambitions, doubts, Fears, concerns, the things that keep you up at night. Whatever you want to use to describe it. What solves those things aren't things. It's God. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. And that's why so many people struggle. Because they don't connect the two. They think, I'm insecure. I'm financially insecure. I'm emotionally insecure. I'm mentally insecure. You know what that's going to solve? My financial insecurity? If I get a house. You know what's going to solve my emotional insecurity? If I get married. You know what's going to solve my mental insecurity? Is if I have a bunch of friends. If I got a bunch of money to do the things that I want to do. And what the world teaches, you know who has those things? God. The prosperity message. So now, all we attribute to God is my problems, which is very... My problems, which at their core, are also not tangible. Fear, doubt, insecurity, desire, ambition. Those are intangible things that manifest themselves into tangible. So what we're looking to solve the intangible, we're looking to tangible. Lord, give me. Lord, do. But everything we see about vulnerability is the answer is God. Him. Does that come with blessings? Yes. Does that come with tangible? Yes. But that is not the answer. It's a byproduct. It's a cherry on top. (laughs) It's benefits. But he is the answer. The relationship that solves the issues that we reveal in our vulnerability is relationship with God. And we have to get the saints, babes in Christ, people we're developing to disciples. We got to get them to understand that connection. I'm going to do a natural parallel to a spiritual. So I'm going to go natural first. Natural, when you're younger and mature, and I'm going to say until you get to about your late, mid-30s, 40s, what you probably value in a relationship is what you can get out of that relationship um, tangibly, physically, stuff like that. But then as you start to get older, what you value in a relationship is stability, faithfulness, someone you can have a really good con- I value really good conversation. Can I have a really good conversation that is full of substance? Like I can't do the the airy stuff. Can't do it. Um, peace, joy. You know, can I have all of that? Lack of drama in the relationship. You don't get to appreciate all that stuff and look for that and require that till you get older and mature. And I think it's the same way spiritually when you're younger. You're looking for all the stuff that God can give you, do for you. But it's as you get this maturity that you really value who he is. Someone I can just really have a great conversation with, go to to talk about my fears, doubts, whatever, be vulnerable with. But then also listen back at him and get feedback, um, a response back. And then the fact that when I'm in his presence, I get fullness of joy, but then there's also peace. And there's all these great byproducts of things that you can't purchase and you can't buy. Um, and it's really 
And, and it takes a level of maturity. Oh, go ahead. It takes a level, I would say, of spiritual maturity to get there. You're not gonna start off there. Um, but it's just really important, so. Adriana, were you trying to say something? Sorry. I'm so sorry, no, Cohen good. took it off. Okay, that's okay. But um, yeah, so, it, 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 again, it, it's building people to this place where they can see these things and value these things, but yeah, because, yeah, you get this relationship or you get this house or you get this from God. What people don't understand is, as I said earlier, there's pros and cons. You didn't have a house before, which meant that you didn't have to worry about the maintenance, the upkeep, put money in the stuff, blah, blah, blah. Now you got the house. Do you think it's just going to sit there and look pretty and um, not corrupt over time? No, you're going to have to put some labor into this, some effort into this. Some. I'll go this way. It's like a garden. And my dad and I talk about this a lot. And people that garden, I see them talk about this a lot. You like my garden because of how well maintained it is. It's not just the flowers. Because I guarantee if I put them same flowers in there and I don't maintain it, they're going to die. Yep. They're going to look corroded. It's going to be weeds everywhere. And what a lot of people, my dad said, a lot of people will be like, oh my God, I love your lawn. Um, like, I would love to do that. What flowers did you get her? Like, what products are you using? And my dad's like, yeah, these things are a part of the equation, but the part that you're going to walk away and not do is water it all the time, cut the grass all the time, weed it all the time. So people say they want all these different things, but what they don't understand is all those things come with maintenance. All those things come with effort. And so it's only as you live, unfortunately, as you matriculate and mature, that you really start to realize the things that I thought I wanted requires way more labor than maybe I'm willing to put in it or, okay, now I gotta put this labor into it. But then aside from that, that's not really what I want from God. What I really want from God is who he is, faithful, um, someone that I can communicate with, someone that loves joy and gives joy, someone that loves peace and gives peace, like all these different things. And it's just really a challenge and that's what we have to face is number one, us coming to this place of realizing that and living that and then getting other people to that place of learning that and realizing that. And this is, and this is where the Lord is coming from. You want who I am and the benefits that come from who I am without the sacrifice of learning who I am. And I see people want that all the time. You want to be friends with a certain person because of what they bring you. You want to marry a certain type of man. You want to marry a certain type of woman because of the benefits. But you don't want none of the work. You don't want none of the sacrifice. All you want to do is complain. I want something for nothing. Yeah. Like Tremiko was saying about the gardening. I, your yard looks phenomenal. I want what you have, but I don't want to do the work exactly. to get it. Yeah. So tell me the shortcut. <laughs> what flowers did you buy? Right. Flowers don't live and sustain themselves independent of them. Exactly. <laughs> what fertilizer and seed do you use for your grass? Because mine got brown spots. This, but it requires watering yep. two times a day, probably three times, I mean two times a week, probably three to four times a week in, in, in the high point of summer. Like, this takes effort. And we look at the Lord the same way. Like, all the answers to my problems are in you, Lord, but I don't want you. Yeah. <laughs> I want the benefits. Yeah. Give me the benefits. You, I can do without. And I see that a lot of times in people's relationships. I want the access you have, so I'm going to be friends with you, but I don't really care about you. Yeah. I don't really want to get to know you. Yeah. I don't want to make the sacrifices it takes because let's just be honest. We all got issues. We got to figure out. We got to work. The Lord doesn't in this example. He is perfect. But we got sacrifices we have to make to be in a relationship with him. For example, I can't be carnal. That's a sacrifice. I can't be living in sin. That's a sacrifice. I have to be willing to admit when I'm wrong. That's a sacrifice. I got to meditate so my mind would be renewed because I can't be in a relationship with him with carnal thinking. That's a sacrifice. But I don't want to do that. Lord, give me the protection. Give me the prosperity. Give me the joy. Give me the peace. Give me the understanding. But I don't want you. Yeah. And that is not being vulnerable. And that is not living in the Lord. And you are going to get nothing from him. Just like with any relationship. 
You cannot get the benefits of being with me if you're not willing to sacrifice to be with me. If you're not willing to learn who I am, if you're not willing to adjust to who I am, if you're not willing to put up with some of my crap, me, Donovan, not the Lord, me, Donovan, I understand that I can be difficult. I can understand that I sometimes am not agreeable. But you had no problem with that when you were getting the benefits. Now you do. And it's the same thing with the Lord's perspective. When you were down and out, when you ain't have nothing, when ain't nobody know who you were, when no one cared about you, you wanted me then. But now, you didn't tasted some of the benefits, you didn't got put on stable ground, you're in a better position. All of a sudden now, you ain't so much worth dealing with. Yeah. We have to remove that mindset. That the issues that our vulnerability reveals, it is not in the things of God that solves them. It is God yeah. who solves them. Yeah. Everybody understand that difference? Yeah. All right, so we are at time. Uh, so next week, well, we're still going to be talking about intimacy, but we're going to move. I kind of alluded, alluded to it today, and I want to share this definition because I thought it was awesome. We're going to be talking about trust. And this is one of the definitions that the, uh, the dictionary actually has that you actually can use. <laughs> and so Webster defines trust as the firm belief in the re reliability, truth, ability, and strength. So to place trust in someone means I firmly believe that you are reliable, truthful, capable, and strong enough to do what you say you're going to do. You have the ability to perform. But that is not a two, not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. There is a trust that God says that you can rely on me for. But in return, we got to be reliable in our thoughts, our words, our deeds. So that's what we'll talk about next week, still going um, in godly intimacy. And then maybe we'll get into... Um, Honesty, and then eventually we'll talk about physical intimacy with God as it manifests through praise, worship, meditation, things like that. All right, just one last any last minute questions, thoughts, or comments? All right, Lord, we just thank you for uh, just another awesome day, Lord. We just thank you for the discussion, the questions, oh God, of truly learning uh, what being vulnerable with you is. And, and I pray that this word falls on good ground and understanding like Lord we just need you we just want you you are the answer who you are is what we need and I pray Lord as we go forward and continue to develop as disciples that you would uh, trust us to bring additional souls and saints to us that they can be developed as well and that we all can be more effective in building your kingdom and pushing your agenda in this fallen world Lord I pray that everyone on the sound of my voice would be protected that they would go forward today and enjoy the weather um, enjoy the start of their week, O oh Lord, until we come again together to dine and fellowship again on your word. Our Lord, we just humbly thank you and appreciate everything that you, every appreciate who you are and everything that you do in our daily lives. And we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.